Here we go, Seahawks. We've got a battleship. They've got a pirate ship. Defense, blow them right out of the water. Okay, that's a miss and a score. Okay, no problem. Offense, you got any answer back? Yes, that's a touchdown. Seven to seven. Here we go. Defense, second chance. What do you got? And you let them score again easily. Okay, no problem. No problem. No big deal. Offense, can you just answer back? Okay, 50-yard field goal attempt. No problem. You're Jason Myers. You got this. You can hit this kind of kick. You did all last season. Oh, nope, that's a miss. Okay, all right. Defense, do you got anything as far as the stop goes? Okay, just hold on, defense there. The offense, can you keep? Yes, another score. Great job, offense. Okay, Myers, PAT, extra point. You got this, no problem. Easy. And you, you doink the extra point. Really? Really? Okay, defense, come on now. Give us a stop. Just something. We need one time. Hold on for the game. Come on. And you let them score now again. Jeez, no stops today, huh? All right, offense, look. I'm level with you. We got 45 seconds and a couple timeouts, but I needed to drive the length of the field and get a field goal. Can you do that? And you did it, awesome. Okay, Myers, short kick, easy, right where you like it. Come on, knock this through. Turn a whole bad day into good. Here's your redemption right now. Here we go. And you missed again, again, again. All right, screw it. Russell, you're gonna have to do the Superman thing today, okay? <laughs> Seahawks beat the Buccaneers. Let's dive into it. Championship focus. Championship oh, focus. Do whatever it takes. Yeah. Whatever it takes, we're going to get it done. Let's go. Hawks on three. One, two, three. Hawks. Another week, another close Seahawk victory. And for me, another visit to the cardiologist. Well, our Hawks pulled off a close back and forth win here that saw five lead changes. But at the end of the day, Russell Wilson was the difference. He played nearly flawlessly in this game as he is in the midst of one of the great quarterback seasons that we have seen of all time. Which is good, because right now the defense is holding on for dear life. They more often than not resemble toilet paper than an actual functional unit. As well, we've reached DEFCON Blair Walsh as far as the kicking game goes. It's getting a little bit hard to watch when they trot him out there and he just looks like now he's getting a case of the yips. But... Despite those detractions, Seattle took care of business, handling a lesser opponent and still putting themselves in prime position to still go out there and get that prize right now, which is home field advantage and a first round bye. If you can go on the road here against San Francisco and take a steal away a win, you really do put yourself in prime position at that point, even with the toughest remaining schedule in the NFL ahead of you. So a great win for the Seahawks here. Great job by Russell Wilson. And it's fun to watch this team play week in and week out. I'll tell you what. Three receivers right on first and ten at the 19 of Tampa Bay. Russ has time, steps up in the pocket. He's going to wait over time. Lock it in. Lock it in. He's For me, the most amazing part of Russell Wilson's year here has been what he has added to his game this season. Imagine a pro basketball player going into an offseason, and he not only suddenly develops a jump shot, a crossover, a jump hook, but also a step back. That's kind of what Russell Wilson's done here. When you look at him, he's added skills that he didn't have at the quarterback position that I was always wondering when they'd come along, but now they have arrived. One place, for instance, to look at is his cadence. In this last game, we came up against the Bucs and Todd Bowles, their defensive coordinator, he likes to blitz more than any other coach in the league, or at least as much as any other coach in the league. Russell knows this, having played him for many years when he was a defensive coordinator with the Cardinals. And what Russell did throughout this entire game from the first quarter through the fourth quarter was he just changed up his cadence. Hut, 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 hut. And what that did is it showed the hand of the Bucks and where they were blitzing from. They knew who was coming, who wasn't coming, who was dropping back in coverage. And that's a big part of Bulls and his blitzing is you don't know where the blitzes are coming from. It's a lot of zone blitzing, let's say. And so the offensive line for the Seahawks through that was able to pick up those blitzes, see where they were coming from. This is a place that Russell didn't have this in the past. Yeah, he'd give you a hut hut here and there and he'd change things up, but never to this degree where he was just really hammering it. And it really helped the offensive line in this game overcome those blitzes and if you noticed Russell wasn't under any hardly any pressure in this game despite throwing a lot attacking mismatches this is again a spot in the past where Russell sometimes will go after a mismatch sometimes won't sometimes you'll see him only attack it for a half 
This game from the first quarter through the fourth quarter, he was going after that, after that kid, Dean, who was covering DK throughout this game. And he knew DK was going to get the best of him as long as he stayed with that matchup. And Russell kept attacking and kept attacking. And while early on there was a catch or two here or there, later in the game it really showed itself as Russell stuck with it. Something, again, I don't think he did as much of in the past. He might have gone back away from that mismatch because he wasn't getting the results early on and instead left some meat on the bone there by the end of the game. Not in this one. He attacked it again and again, and he crushed that kid by the end of the game. It was awesome to see. Pocket manipulation. There was a game a few years ago where Russell Wilson was talking with Coach Bevel, on the uh, former offensive coordinator on the sideline, and the NFL Films actually showed the play really well where Russell dropped back, and the, there was only one pass rusher coming at him. The lineman was going to push the pass rusher around him, and if he just climbed the ladder, as they say, that's what they call it, is climbing the ladder as a quarterback back into the pocket, he could have bought himself a second of manipulation to then throw the deep ball. And Bevel makes this point to him at the time on the sideline saying you could have stepped up, and the films kind of showed it, and it was a part of Russell's game that has really not ever come along. He doesn't want to climb up into that pocket. Why? Because those big guys get that much more bigger the closer you get to them. And, it, and now you need those lanes opened up that much wider to get the ball out and not get it knocked down. But Russell, in this game, on that first touchdown to Tyler Lockett, drops back and the same kind of situation occurs. He's got one pass rusher coming. The rest of the line is very well blocked. So what does he do? He sort of backs, goes forward to look like he's climbing the pocket, which sort of just stops the rusher for just a half second, allows the offensive lineman to hold his block, gives Tyler another second to run the wheel route, and then drops back out to throw the deep ball, takes another step back. That's pocket manipulation. That's something that Russell Wilson has never had in the past. He's always been, is it is there, is there, go. Is there, there, throw it away. He's never been a guy that sort of just wants to still stay back in that pocket, wait for things to kind of develop. Watching that attribute added to his game is going to make him impossible to defend. Because now you can't just constantly count on him if one, two, three seconds go by, he's breaking the pocket. He might still sit in there and hang in there. And I've seen him do this year a couple times when if he sees and looks around and actually knows, hey, wait, I got a clean pocket, he'll hang in there with it. And then that deep play will open up down the field and he'll hit it. Whereas if he's just running and scrambling around, he can't always get his feet set and throw as far as he wants to throw it on those type of plays. So... Pocket manipulation, another attribute Russell Wilson's added to his game. It's the play fake by Russell, who stops, looks, throws back side. Last week, the Seahawks signed Josh Gordon after they claimed him off the waiver wire from the New England Patriots. There's nothing not to love about this move. It's the ultimate low cost, high reward. You can cut him at any time. He's only making, I think, about a million dollars for the rest of the season. He is a phenomenal talent. He's put up some great yardage seasons with guys like Brandon Whedon and Jason Campbell throwing him the football. And as well, I don't think New England was exactly getting the most out of his abilities. Tom Brady, when you watch him now on those deep balls, it's just kind of a struggle. It looks a lot like Peyton Manning there at the end where he just can't push the ball 40, 50 yards down the football field like he used to. Brady's still very good on the intermediate routes. He's still very accurate on those. But he, Jordan's, uh, Gordon's game is to run deep, is to take those deep posts and the deep shots. And if you're not taking advantage of that and you're asking him to do these precise short routes, which is a lot of what New England does as well, they do a lot of option routes where the quarterback and receiver have to be psychically on the same page. It's probably just asking a lot out of him and not asking him to do the things he does really well. In Seattle, that's not going to be the case. They don't need you to run the whole route tree. We need you to run certain routes really good. And when you get your select opportunities to moss a guy deep, do so. For me, this move's success is not going to come down to whether he can be good on the football field. If Gordon gets on the football field playing with Russell Wilson, even right out the gate, I have no doubts he'll be very good. Where we got to watch and wonder is how he's doing throughout the week. If he makes it through the first couple of weeks, we're good to go. But you know these first couple of weeks, the Hawk organization's watching him like a hawk, for lack of a better term. And is he getting to those meetings on time? Is he giving maximum effort and practice where always compete is one of their mantras? If he's doing that, he'll be great come game day because we don't need him to do all the weird stuff that they do in New England. We'll simplify a lot for him, let him just make this game real easy. Go down the field, beat that guy in front of you. And with DK and Lockett on the other side of him, he's potentially going to be up against the third best cornerback on the opposition team. And when was the last time do you think Josh Gordon was playing against the third best cornerback on the opposition? 
I bet even not even in high school. Blocking scheme. Let's bring in all three receivers again. Metcalf wide to the far side. Ross takes the shotgun snap. Looks, throws inside. Ball is caught. Is it an A couple of weeks ago, when Chris Carson was in the midst of his fumbleitis issues, I presented the argument that this was part of the cost of doing business when you have a running back of this type. Those that are hard to bring down are going to go for every last yard, never want to go out of bounds. They're just going to have more of a tendency to fumble than the average running back. And you've seen historically examples even in great running backs like Walter Payton or Adrian Peterson, who had terrible problems with fumbling right in the middle of the prime of his career. Even the Seahawks' own Marshawn Lynch had over 30 fumbles throughout his career. So again, some of this is the cost of doing business, and you can feel all right with that. Carson has gone past that point now. With two more fumbles in this last game, I believe he's up to eight on the season. And this offense has no room for error at this point. We're seeing with the defense and the way that they're getting run through by even functional offenses that the offense almost has to play perfectly. I mean, look at Russell Wilson. He has one interception on the season, yet how many close games have we been in? He's, I think, leading the league in throwing touchdowns, yet how many close games have we been in? So it looks to me like it's time to potentially offload some of these carries for Chris Carson, especially when you factor in he's on pace for 360 touches for the season. 300 touches for a running back in this modern NFL is considered a lot. 360 is like having two, three extra games on those legs. And if we don't happen to win this game against the 49ers this week on Monday night, and I'm not conceding that game by any measure, but if you don't win that game, then there's almost all but a guarantee that Seahawks are going to have to go on the road in order to get back to the Super Bowl. And if that happens, you're going to need every bullet in your gun. And that most certainly is going to include Chris Carson. Meanwhile, we've got Rashad Penny sitting on the bench, the former first-round pick. This guy in his small sample size is averaging 4.9 yards per carry this season. It's the same thing that he averaged last season. Five yards per carry for a running back is very, very good in the NFL. As well, Rashad Penny has yet in his, in his limited carries to have any fumbles. So... You could kill two birds with one stone here. You could not only preserve Chris Carson for the playoffs by offloading some of those carries to a guy who might even get more yards than he does potentially. We really don't know at this point. As well, you potentially, it looks like, could mitigate some of those fumble issues by lowering the amount of carries and lowering the amount of potential times that Carson's going to fumble. Just an idea. Congratulations are in order for one Bobby Wagner, who last week became the all-time leading Seahawk tackler and this week crossed a thousand total tackles. This guy's had almost a quietly phenomenal career. He got lost a little bit in the Legion of Boom shuffle early on, but he certainly appears now on pace for a Hall of Fame career. And there are those out there who say now that he has perhaps lost a step as he's gotten a little bit older, but when you look at him statistically, he's still third in the league in total tackles. He just had a key sack on a, on a blitz in this last game, and he looks still pretty darn good to him, to me. As well, when you look historically speaking, middle linebacker tends to be a position that allows for players to play into their mid-30s. There's different positions on the field the guys kind of phase out quick, right? Cornerback, you can't get past 30. It seems like you're done at that point. Running back, 28 is the magical age. But middle linebackers, those guys can get into the mid-30s and still be very, very good football Football players. And we've seen this recently with Ray Lewis and London Fletcher, who Bobby Wagner fits right into that same profile. Those uber quick guys who could afford to maybe lose a half step or a step as they got older. So here's to hoping Bobby still got a few more great years left in him. He still looks pretty darn good to me. Boy, Jaron Reed sure has fit in on an underperforming defensive line, hasn't he? In the three games since he's been back off his suspension, Jaron's put up the following stat line. Eight total tackles, no tackle for losses, no sacks, no forced fumbles, no fumble recoveries, no batted down balls at the line of scrimmage, and one quarterback hit. It's not getting the job done. Right now, Jadavian Clowney is the only guy giving us any kind of motochrome of pass rush. And this is a guy the Seahawks have to make a decision on as we move into this offseason. Do you franchise him, give him a contract extension, or let him walk in free agency? And unfortunately, with this type of production right now, that third option is looking like the most likely. But not all is not lost. If Jaron can pull it together for this back end of these games on the schedule, if he can do good in the playoffs, this guy can earn himself a tremendous amount of coin. And maybe it's too much to expect him to be at that 10.5 sack mark that he hit last season, but just give us at least 
half of that, and it will help this defense by leaps and bounds. The backup running back coming on a little flare pass. He gets hit, knocked off his feet by Blair. A two-yard gain, not nearly enough. Ooh! Way to blast that fool. All right, hey, listen to me. Hey! The pro football focus grades came out from this past game against the Bucks, and it was interesting to note on the defensive side of the football that the top-rated player was not Bobby Wagner or Jadavian Clowney, but Marquise Blair. This guy has been an absolute player since he's come into the lineup. And while it is hard to assess the free safety position because they tend to be lined up out of frame when you're watching the game, and especially in the Seahawks defense where the free safeties really play in that center field, it still is important to note that he hasn't given up that deep ball over the top. He is always in that proper position taking that away. And as simple as that seems, let's not forget that Tedrick Thompson seemed to every game early on this season give up a deep ball over the top. He lost his coverage time in and time again. And while it's great to see great hits and Marquise Blair to be awesome in the run game, that first point is, a, is an important point in the Seahawks defense. We can't give up the 40, 50, 60 yard bombs. We need to let these teams earn their way up the football field, especially when you're struggling to get sacks and pressure and struggling to get a lot of interceptions and forced fumbles. So it's good to see him playing in the role he needs to play with it. As well, this guy looks like a really complete player. When he was coming out of college, I thought, uh, how is this going to work? You just spent a second round pick on a safety who's a hard hitting safety, laying people out all over the place. The NFL is really trying to legislate that out of the game. How is that going to work? But he indeed has found a way at, at, to pick his spots and moments and hit guys at spots where I think over time you're going to see receivers not wanting to go into his zone or being very aware that he's nearby and bearing down upon him. So awesome to see that that pick has worked out. Between him and DK, we might have just already pulled out two pro bowlers from this last draft. If not this year, then maybe next year and moving into the future. Throughout the season, I've preached patience as it concerns Jason Myers' struggles here with the Seahawks. I argued that you signed this kicker in the offseason to a multi-year deal. He was a pro bowler only last year, kicking in a very difficult stadium in New York. And that Pete Carroll, in the way that he plays football games or coaches football games, understands that he's always going to be in close games and that he needs to have the opportunity to trot out a quality kicker who can hit a 50-yarder every once in a while. With that said... And lo and behold, you happen to have an awesome alternative just sitting right there. You have a Pro Bowl Hall of Fame quarterback in the middle of his MVP season. You have an offense playing spectacularly, one of the best in the league, if not the best in the league. You have a massive offensive line built of guys that weigh 350 pounds. You have a running back that can grind out the toughest of yards when he's got every sort of manner of man hanging off of him. Why not on fourth and shorts look at this as an alternative? The analytic guys have been saying for years to do this. The nerds, they've been saying for years, go for it when you're on your up, the opponent's side of the football field and it's fourth and short. The numbers show you should go for it. And most coaches are always hesitant to do it because they go, hey, it's not your job at stake, nerd. If I make the wrong call, it's the newspapers writing about me going for it saying, why do you go for it? But Carol's a guy who's been here for 10 years. Tell me that this is not a guy with some job security. So why not go for it? Add into the fact that you have maybe the best team in the league in the red zone, meaning that if you convert that first down, there's going to be a good chance that you probably get inside the 20. And we know once you get inside the 20, there's a great chance you're going to score a touchdown. I could maybe understand having some hesitancy if you weren't great in the red zone because as you go, well, what's the difference between kicking the field goal attempt at the 32-yard line and at the 17? But that's not the case. You've built this team with a phenomenal offense, and there is no room for error right now with this team. Take advantage of it. Go for it when you're on fourth and short in the opponent's side of the football field. Lord knows they're doing it to us, and they're having success with it. See the Ravens game. So come on, Pete. Use those big cojones that you got, and let's get something going. Can you win the game in the first quarter? No! Can you win the game in the second quarter? No! Can you win the game in the third quarter? No! You gotta be careful now. Can you win the game in the fourth quarter? Yeah! Offensively, the Bucks did the best job of any other team this season in attacking Seahawks' tendency to go to the bail technique with their cornerbacks. Uh, of course, there's been plenty of quarterbacks this season that have been able to rip through this team pretty well. Your Andy Daltons, your Matt Schaubs. 
But really, really this week it was crystallized on how they were attacking us, which was really on those deep posts to Mike Evans. Obviously, Mike Evans is potentially a top three receiver in this league. He is very good. Godwin is also very good. But that's what you were watching them do. And so what you see with the Seahawks cornerbacks is they go into this bail technique, it seems like, 75 to 80% of the time. Meaning that after the snap, they're going to go 10 yards dropping backwards this way. So what the quarterback knows is that his receiver at that point is going to have a free release and that that, that cornerback, when he shows that technique, is going to try to cover the deep end of the field. He's going to protect against the deep ball. So everything else is in play, be it a dig, be it a post, be it a comeback. And that's exactly what the Bucks did is they attacked on all of those other different routes that were wide open again and again and again. You can overcome this if you have some pass rush. But right now, the Seahawks don't have any pass rush. Those deep posts especially tend to be five to seven step drops. But quarterbacks could have a 15 step foot drop on this defensive line and they'd still have plenty of time to get rid of the ball. I don't know where the solution lies on this. Again, a lot of these issues to me come down to schematic problems, not personnel issues. Maybe that's the upshot is that if you just change out some of how you do this schematically, eventually you can fix these issues, but you're not going to do that in season. We're going to have to ride with what we got and hope something can prevail or get a little bit better. Maybe the offense can play just so out of their mind amazing throughout the rest of this season that they play at this you know, Michael Jordan-like level of offense that they can overcome whatever happens with us defensively. Maybe I'm not going to paint Russell Wilson in that corner at this point. He has defied expectations throughout his career, so why not that as well? We'll see what happens this week against the Niners. Expect a hard-fought, dogfight-type game. These divisional matchups always prove out to be that. But I'm sure hope it's going to be a fun one. I'm super hyped forward. Haven't been this hyped for a regular season game in probably a couple years. I really appreciate all of you out there watching the channel. We continue to just grow and grow and grow. And I just can't believe it, actually. I'm just in awe sometimes of how fast this is going. Thank you, as always, for subscribing, watching. Your comments are always welcome. Any ideas for improvements for the channel, please put them down there. I'm always listening and watching. As well, uh, I'm working on the next Great Seahawk Moment video, looking for some ideas. Somebody mentioned the Packers Seahawk Championship game of a few years ago. That's certainly on my list. If you've got any other ideas, please do post them below. And as always, don't ever forget, please do not ever forget. Go Hawks! Go Hawks!